This is the top 10 most insane contemporary art exhibitions of the last season. If you're confused why this is coming out in July, it's because the art season is like the school year, September through June. There were in the last year over 3,000 contemporary art exhibitions in New York City. These are the ones that you seriously need to know about. Oh, and we're going in chronological order. Urs Fischer at the Gaugosian Gallery presented nine autonomous self-driving office chairs. So when you were not in the gallery, they would do this coordinated dance. But the second you stepped in, they would be aware of your existence and approach you or play with you. Each of the nine chairs had their own unique personalities. The way I think the entire thing works from, from talking to the security guards and other people in the gallery is that the entire ceiling was outfitted with like infrared sensors that could pick up the heat of the people in the room. That information was communicated to a brain in a separate room, which you could go view and then wirelessly transmitted to all of the chairs. So it's not only like self-driving car technology, but it's also uh, artificial intelligence machine learning because as this exhibition was going on, the computer was learning the behavior of, of the typical person walking into the gallery. So it could predict how future people would move in the gallery and make the entire system more efficient. But if you want something you know, for your wall. Uh, running simultaneously was Liza Liu at the Lehman Maupin Gallery. It looked like uh, dirty painter's rags when you walked into the gallery, but if you got up close, you would see that every single cloth was made up of tens of thousands of hand-sewn beads that were then dyed or painted, and then she took back into her studio and smashed with a hammer or a rock to create these kind of holes in the bead fabric, often two or three layers deep. So not only an incredible amount of work, but, but also an incredible amount of destruction of work in the hopes of, of achieving something bigger. But if you think that's crazy, there were also two drawings in the room in which she draws the beads. These, these took an estimated 11 years to complete. And during this time, she has this kind of meditative habit of singing with every line she makes. So, whoop, whoop, whoop. Like she just does that as she's working. And this is the reason it makes the top 10 list. There was this like secret elevator in the show that takes you down to the basement where there is a film playing. She filmed herself drawing these for all of this time and then hired a team to edit them into this poetic symphony. I'm just, I'm just gonna play like seven seconds of this film for you. This is her drawing and her voice. Daniel Arsham was on view at the Periton Gallery in the Lower East Side, which highlighted two cars. One was a 1981 DeLorean that was kind of decaying and crystallizing at the same time, and the other one was this white 1961 Ferrari 250 GT California. So, so the DeLorean was a reference to, honestly, my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> Back to the Future, and that was a real DeLorean that he purchased and then carved out pieces so he could make it look crystallizing, and it was actually driven slowly into the gallery. But the 1961 Ferrari GT California has an even in more incredible story because that car is from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The 1961 Ferrari 250 GT California. And I'm not a huge, huge car person, uh, but if you are, you will know that that car is one of the most rare cars in the world. It is his love. It is his passion. It is so rare that in the, in the movie, when they were filming it, none of the actors were allowed to even touch it. So, so for this scene in the movie, that is not actually the real car. It is a prop maker who made a replica of the car so that they could smash it. And so similarly, Daniel Arsham could also not get the car to even make a cast of it for this sculpture. So what he did 
brilliant, was got the actual prop guy from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, who's still alive and kicking it and doing awesome, to make a replica car just like the one he made in the movie so that Daniel Arsham could make a cast of it and then make this sculpture. Hugh Hayden at the Listen Gallery. So Hugh is a Brooklyn sculptor, and I imagine it's pretty hard to get wood in New York City, so this is what his earlier work looks like. This is made out of old Christmas trees that he found on the sidewalks of New York City. It's just a free material that he could use. And when he carves the furniture, typically, he leaves the branches on, which become this not only connected to the material that it was, but then also it has this, this layer of depth and meaning. Maybe it's an aura, of a spiritual aura. And this year, he stepped it up by getting wood not from the sidewalks of New York City, but from the U.S.-Mexican border, specifically trees that were removed by the U.S. government to secure the border better. So maybe they are creating lines of sight by removing brush or getting ready for a wall. And so Hugh, by, by using wood from this specific area, and he's carving a family furniture like this dinner table called America. It is carved from mesquite. If you've ever wanted to know what the wood that flavors your potato chips look like, this is made from mesquite, which, which also, by the way, uh, as I understand it, is an invasive species to the United States. So there's that meaning. And it is a tree that has thorns. So though he's cut the thorns off and, and carved it into furniture, he's re-represented those thorns in the dinner table. And this baby crib, stop thinking about it for a second, because the reason I love it so much is not because it's about babies, it's because of the actual wood itself. This is carved from a wood called Texas Ebony. And Texas Ebony, I looked it up, is really cool because it has this, this almost black. And so when he's carving it, he, this is not painted or stained or burned in any way. He's just, the way he's carving the crib is just along that line. And this blew my mind to such a degree that I went out and bought a piece of Texas Ebony. I read and write for Design Milk. So I'm going to plug it because I write for it, but I also buy stuff that they feature because I love it so much. So this is a Japanese ruler made of ebony. So you have the, uh, the dark part and the light part, and then this is resin. And you'll see me use it uh, in past YouTube videos. It's my favorite ruler. Anthony McCall's Light Sculptures on view at the Sean Kelly Gallery. So what these are uh, are really movies. There's a movie projector that is projecting an animated white line. Uh, really, really slow moving. So even though these are still pictures, like that's pretty much what it looks like, except you can see the steam moving through the light. And then you are allowed to step into these things and, and let the, the light cone move around you. But what was kind of the new breakthrough of this show is that he added a mirror to one of them. Be be because there's two things that are great about these sculptures. One is being in them and experiencing them. And the second thing that is that is cool about it is bringing a friend with you because it's really cool to be a spectator of someone else in this show. And so by adding a mirror to it, not only are you getting the light double reflecting, so you get two kind of cones that you can stand within, but you can also look at yourself. So this is me taking a photograph at the mirror and the entire time I'm in it, I can actually see myself as a spectator and a viewer doing it. Nama Sabar presented an exhibition of smashed electric guitars that any visitor entering the gallery could play. What she did is smashed the guitars. <laughs> And wherever the chunks landed, she screwed those pieces into the floor and then re-strung the guitars, making them new instruments based on how they smashed. And when you, when you plucked a string, you would find that the sound came from one of the paintings on the wall. So around the room were these kind of abstractions of knobs and chords, and what they really were were kind of deassembled, reconfigured amplifiers so that the guitars, each of the guitars plugged into them. So, fun, a great show for well-behaved kids, but also a deeper message about recovering from abuse, about making something beautiful from destruction. The climax of the show was that a lot of female musicians came into the room and did a concert on all of the instruments simultaneously. If you want to know what something like that sounds like, 
I've put a link in the description and I've made a playlist of my favorite YouTube videos that have to do with everything I'm talking about right now. Check out all of those. Alistja Kafwada, in the category of names I'm learning how to pronounce, so I hope I have that right. Alistja Kafwada at the 303 Gallery. I'm just gonna show the Instagram video I took of this show. It is a series of boulders with mirrors in between. The, the mirrors are standing straight up, only supported by the boulders, so this is like a symbiotic relationship. This is a grape. I'm gonna demonstrate basically how this works if you can't tell from my video. If you take similar objects and put them in a row with a mirror in between them, you can't tell the difference between the reflection of the grape before it and the real grape after it. So the mirrors appear like glass, and you can do this with gummy bears or toy rhinoceroses, but the most important thing is that they have to be identical as reflections, which means the one after it has to be built to be a mirrored reflection of the first one. So the real boulder is in the middle, so that's a real boulder. And then she 3D scanned it and, and carved or created exact mirrored opposites of it on either side. And the further it gets away from the real boulder, the more it morphs into like a sphere or a cube each time changing materials. Which, which uh, she didn't say anything about it, the gallery didn't say much about it, but not only are you getting down to its elemental forms of sphere and cube, but I think, I think you're also getting down to elemental forms of quartz and and, and iron, which make up granite. So you're literally like deconstructing this boulder. It's just, it's just really, I'm just saying words right now to take up time so that you can watch this on repeat because I never wanted to leave the gallery walking around this thing. Robert Longo at Metro Pictures. If you're a fan of the channel, I highlighted his work five years ago because he's one of the best draftsmen in the world. He reproduced with near pinpoint microscopic accuracy famous abstract expressionist paintings with just charcoal on white paper to scale. But this year you walk into the gallery and there's not a drawing, it's just this weird sculpture in the middle of the room. It's called Death Star 2018 and as you approach you find out it is made from 40,000 bullets. A commentary on increased gun violence and mass shootings in the United States. And the most important part of this entire thing was actually at the top, this, this chain. This ball actually weighed close to 4,000 pounds. Super heavy and all supported by this tiny chain. One day I'm sure this is going to go to a museum. Uh, because it's not only su super cool to look at, but it marks a moment in history, and I'm sure a museum's going to put up ropes around this because it is legit a liability. I mean, I mean, it's it's crazy to me that one these shows exist. That that two you can be in the gallery by yourself for 20 minutes. Do you know what I'm saying? And three that they, that they trust you to such a degree that there's no glass on the paintings or ropes around the gallery because the the fragileness of these shows is often everything. Like the number one best surprise of the year was Raina Dietrich at the Spencer Brownstone Gallery, who presented a carpet in the middle of the room made entirely of dirt. So she went to Oklahoma and hand picked dirt, hand sifted the dirt, shipped the dirt 2,000 miles to the gallery and created the pattern of the carpet using pieces of sneakers. This is a dirt carpet made from footsteps. Like I have, I have two categories of art, uh, inhale works and exhale works, and this is an inhale work because I walked in the room and I went, ah, like that. Like that's how cool this show was. Meanwhile, its exact opposite was a few blocks away at a secret gallery. Alex Israel at the Rena Spallings Gallery. This gallery is so hard to find that I made a quick time-lapse video of how to enter it. So you find an unmarked door, you hit the unmarked buzzer, you go to the second floor to another unmarked door, and in it is another insanely high-tech show. It is a self-portrait of the artist playing the saxophone as a hologram. This is the same technology used to create the Tupac Shakur hologram, the Michael Jackson hologram, and at, at Disney's Haunted Mansion, all of the ghosts are created with this technology. 
But uh, what Alex Israel has done is just shown you how it works. Like he's literally pulled back the curtain and shown you how the device works by, by raising it out of the floor so you can see the projector that is that is the source of the image and you can see the angle of the screen and the fact that you had to struggle for 10 minutes to even find the door makes the impact of how kind of sparkly and high tech this experience was 1000% better. This is just part one of the top 10 shows of the year because there was so many. I'm creating another video, the top 10 shows of the year that could fit in my apartment if you're interested in seeing creativity compressed to a small size, and then the top 10 shows of the year for kids. You know how I did the, the gummy bear thing? This is one I experimented with rainbow gummy bears. So a lot of shows that I, I come home and I just, for, for weeks, I like to kind of play with the concepts. It's really fun. So if you have kids or if you're a kid at heart, I'm gonna make a video of just those things, 10 additional things. So make sure you subscribe to this video so you catch all of that. If you want to hang out with me in New York City so that I can show you where all the secret doors are and take you to the best shows of the year in real time, jump to my website, the2percent.com. Thank you, everybody. I will see you at the galleries. Dang, it is, it is one of the hardest things of the year to pick the 10 which is why I'm cheating with 30, but there's one additional show I want to talk about because it it just, I felt it didn't work super good for YouTube, but I loved it so much. I can't, I can't cut it. It is the, the number one most captivating show of the year. And by, by captivating, I mean, I couldn't leave the gallery. It's a 45 minute film. Here's just a piece of it. And I have this huge schedule and I had meetings and I missed all of them because I was stuck in the gallery. I couldn't stand up and leave, so I wanted to give it a shout out. It is a video by Hans Optebeek. And again, it was this 45 minute film where there's two hands like building this black and white models of various scenes that would sometimes snow with like toothpaste or, or flood. And it was so hypnotic and so beautiful. And then when you do finally leave, uh, you're exited into this room where there's models that are like inspired by or from that film that are sitting atop uh, tripods, like film tripods. So you feel like you're in the studio and in the film at the same time, while the soundtrack of just of what you just watched is bleeding through the walls so that you feel like you're in the film in real life, which sounds like it would be so boring and yet again, hypnotic could not leave the gallery. So shout out to Hans Optebeek. Check all that out. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Boom.